I wanted to give you what I think is the solution to the rotating pendulum. So we have a disc which is allowed to rotate about its center with an angular speed of omega and we have the pendulum of length L and mass M is allowed to rotate about the vertical. So there's a lot of degrees of freedom here. It might be best to use a Lagrangian approach. So the Lagrangian by definition is kinetic minus potential. So here's my equation for my kinetic energy and my potential here, which I have not really defined with any form, is really just going to be gravitational potential energy, which is going to be mg r, or r is some height. So I'm going to use a body diagram here. I'm going to define the center of the disk as my origin. And I'm going to define an angle theta, which is the angle made with respect to the horizontal. Phi is the angle the pendulum makes with the vertical. I'm going to define this as my positive y direction, that is to say up, and my x direction is positive to the right. So I'm going to define a vector from the origin to the attachment point. I'm going to call that r, and then I'm going to take the vector from the attachment point to the mass, I'll let that be r prime. And I'm going to take the resultant, or the vector addition, as being curly r, which is going to be from the origin to the mass. So simply put, curly r is equal to r plus r prime. r is defined as simply being the point to the attachment with respect to the origin, which is pretty easy to see is cosine omega t sine omega t. And omega t is really just theta. And r prime is going to be negative in the y direction because I've defined this to be my plus y. So really we can see that's just minus cosine of phi. And my x direction, which was defined to be positive, is going to be sine phi. So, copying down what I wrote, curly r is the resultant of r plus r prime. And I've simply rewritten. So we're going to combine into one vector instead of two separate vectors. So my position vector with respect to my origin, r, simply added component-wise, but I want kinetic energy, which means I need the speed. So the speed is just the time derivative of r. And I have not explicitly stated here, but phi can change with time. So when we take the derivative of phi with respect to time, we will get a phi dot by the chain rule. So it's pretty standard stuff. Derivative of cosine is minus sine, but then we have the omega out front. Derivative of sine phi is going to be cosine phi, but we need the phi dot because phi is allowed to change with time. And right here we have sine omega t derivative, just cosine omega t with an extra omega. Derivative of minus cosine phi is going to now be plus sine phi with the phi dot out front. So we need v squared, which is just going to be v dotted with v, which is just going to be the magnitude squared of my vector v. So I just square each component. And carrying down to the next line, I see that this quantity squared, or rather this quantity squared, is just this. So foiling 
for a second. We're going to square this term. It's where this one comes from. We're going to square this term. It's where this comes from. And then we're going to multiply this times this, and then add to it this times this. And there we are left with. And then coming down to the second line here is just this quantity foiled. So this quantity squared is right here. This quantity squared is right here. And then again, we're going to multiply this times this, and add it to this times that. We're left with this. So now we can find the kinetic energy. After we group terms. So you can see we can group these terms here. The sine squared omega t plus cosine squared omega t is going to add together to be 1. Cosine squared phi plus sine squared phi will add together to be 1. Bringing down, we're then left with this, which is the addition of cosine omega t sine phi plus sine omega t cosine phi. Or rather, minus, sorry. And we're going to simplify this using the trig identity. In this case, u will be phi, and v will be omega t. So here we are left with the final speed, squared. And then, carrying down to my Lagrangian, which is going to be my kinetic, which is 1 half m times v squared, which we've defined. And I've jumped to it here, but this is my gravitational potential energy. So the mg times my y position. Now, where did this come from? This came from simply the y coordinate of my position. Now moving to the Euler-Lagrange equations, I see that the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to phi is going to be a force. It's equal to the time derivative of my Lagrangian, of the der derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to phi dot. So this is a momentum times the time derivative, really, is going to give me a force. So this completely equivalent to Newton. So doing that real quick, we will see m r omega l phi dot cosine phi minus omega t minus m g l sine phi is simply equal to the force. And of course we have to equate it with another force. This I've already done is already the time derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to phi dot. And we're going to have the derivative here came from taking the derivative, rather, of sine minus omega t. Taking that derivative with respect to time, we're left with essentially two cosine terms, but I'm grouping it together for simplicity. But we can see we can cancel this phi dot term with this phi dot term. So those will cancel. And bringing down, we get pretty close to what will be the final equation of motion. So ml squared phi double dot minus mr omega squared l cosine phi minus omega t plus mgl sine phi. And dividing by ml squared, we're left with this term here. Now, if I turn off omega, that is to say I don't spin the disk and I simply let the pendulum oscillate, what do I get? I get this equation. We would have hoped to recover this from our equation of motion, and it looks like we have. So using the usual small angle approximation the sine of phi is going to be approximately equal to phi 
and then setting the natural frequency of the oscillator, omega naught squared is just simply g over L.